All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, next up, we have Warner Losh, who is going to be talking about Cumia user mode in just a second. <laughs> when you're ready, Warner. Um, yeah, let me start the slideshow. Let me share the screen and then start the slideshow. And then I'll be ready to go. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I'm gonna talk today a little bit about uh, the BSD user stuff that we're using to build packages and the state of um, where we are in upstreaming it because it would be really nice if we uh, had that functionality upstream so we don't have to keep uh, our patches um, in a tree. So for those of you who don't know, QMU is a full, um, it's an emulating system. It does three different things primarily. Um, it's a full system emulator. So um, you can boot a particular type of a machine and you have a, the traditional kernel that runs on top of that, just like you would boot on bare metal. Um, it's also a virtualization environment, kind of akin to Beehive, where you can have a number of virtual machines that are all managed through QMU. Um, and it's also a user mode emulator. That's what I'm gonna be talking about today. That's basically taking it uh, rather than a system wide level down to the process level. If you'd like to find more information about QEMU more generally, um, you can find that on QEMU.org. So um, at my BSD CAN talk, I gave a little bit of an overview of uh, all of these things in addition to uh, user mode. But let me talk a little bit more about that here. Um, in general, when you've got a physical machine, you've got uh, a number of different processes, they're running on top of a kernel um, and they're interacting with some sort of CPU. The CPU executes the instructions natively uh, and when there's some kind of exception, that gets trapped into the kernel. So if you divide by zero, you make a system call, um, overflow or underflow floating point computations. Sometimes those are the sorts of uh, traps that will lead um, to the kernel and the kernel is expected to uh, cope with those changes or cope with those traps. Um, with uh, BSD user, um, QMU takes the CPU part of its emulation system uh, and it's a uh, soft MMU part of the emulation system. And instead of bolting on um, hardware emulation that emulates buses and cards and disks and so forth, uh, it handles um, the uh, CPU traps directly so that you can um, pull up a individual process and basically attach an emulation kernel to it. Uh, and the uh, QMU then basically inside of a BSD user, there's a CPU loop that uh, executes series of instructions. And whenever there's an exception, it kicks it out. And then we cope with that exception. Um, for the most part, the only exceptions that are interesting are system calls. Uh, and so for the different system calls, we decode the system call that the uh, process would like to make and make that as a FreeBSD native system call. Um, we also have to deal with how we do signals and threads and all of that stuff uh, needs to be emulated uh, by the BSD user module. Um, so in general, why should we care about this? This sounds like some cool um, uh, functionality, but what do we use it for? Well, um, currently the package builders are using it to build ARMv7 and RISC-V packages. Um, also outside of the package cluster, uh, a number of people are using it for ARCH64 because they don't have big beefy machines uh, to build it for. So we get a lot of our packages for non-tier one platforms um, out of, uh, out of the QMU environment. And I'll talk about how to set that environment up a little bit later. Um, but uh, looking at the statistics for the latest builds, um, there are about 32,000, 33,000 packages that get built each time we do a package run uh, or do a full package run. Uh, for AMD64, there's a few less for uh, 
I386. Uh, and if you look at ARCH64, uh, there's about 10,000 that are run, but we recently had some build breakages. And so I don't know if that's an incremental or uh, a full package run. Uh, I was looking at the numbers just before this talk and don't know any more details uh, beyond that. Um, and there's about 15,000 packages that uh, ARM v7 uh, seems to build. Uh, and that's down from a high of about 20,000. Different things break over time uh, with QMU. Uh, and uh, I guess about 5K worth of packages are broken. The difference between the 15K and the 32K in large part is that some very popular languages are broken, Go and Rust. And I'll, I'll talk about that in here in a little bit. Um, uh, MIPS, PowerPC, and RISC V um, also appear uh, to have had runners in the past. Um, PowerPC and RISC V are still current. I'll talk about what happened to MIPS later in the talk, although RISC V only seemed to have 500 packages built if I read the stats right. And I may have been misreading them. I read them a little bit in a hurry before um, the talk. So Pudrier, um, as with all things in the project, it seems, Pudrier supports this um, build setup. So uh, with Pudrier, you can create a uh, jail. And the, the, the jail um, has, in this case, ARMv7 uh, binaries in it so that you can run a full um, emulated, uh, user mode emulated uh, jail. Um, on an AMD64 box. Uh, Pudrier also has some optimizations so that we build our compilers and tool chain natively for the machine it's running on, but have it by default produce the binaries for the target. Uh, and that speeds up builds rather substantially. Sean Bruno and Stacy Son did a talk about this a number of years at BSD CAN um, for the optimizations. Um, in fact, these days the optimizations are the default and not the um, uh, people are messaging me. Sorry, these days the optimizations are the default and you need to opt into them. Um, so uh, people are saying on IRC that my numbers come from a bad run. So I'll totally grant that. Um, so what this Pudriar command does is it creates a, a FreeBSD jail that has the, all the binaries that you need. And then um, to do a bulk build, you can um, do a uh, Pudriar bulk and just specify this jail just like you would for any other uh, run of packages that you're going to do. Um, I added the handy-f command, which lets you have a list of things to build. Usually when I'm testing, I only try to build 20 things, but they're so representative that and if anything, if I've broken anything, I, it shows up right away. Um, and this takes between three and five times longer than a normal run does, um, in part because the user mode emulation is a little bit slow, and in part because there are some uh, ports that uh, run away with depending on which version of QMU that you're using. Uh, they'll just run away and that takes a while for us to time out. Um, so if you're gonna do any BSD user work, you need to test BSD user. Um, in addition to building all of the packages as a, as a useful test, um, sometimes it's useful to run FreeBSD's uh, testing infrastructure with Cua. Uh, and so you would start up uh, the ARMv7 jail if it's not already started. Um, I just use jexec to get a shell into the um, jail. I know Pudrier has a special mode uh, for dealing with that. I always forget what it is and I always can remember jexec. I'm sure people on IRC will um, uh, report if I'm remembering correctly or incorrectly about this. But once you have a shell, regardless of how you get it, um, you can run the QA test just like you would normally. This can be useful uh, in two ways. Um, one, if you have um, a native bare metal uh, 
machines available. You can run the QA test there to get a baseline of what works on that particular architecture, which is a useful number to have. In addition, you can uh, run uh, different uh, AA tests. So, you know, I don't know what the right number is on, on bare metal, but I know before my changes, 8,000 tests passed, and after my changes, 8,012 passed. So that's a good change. Or, you know, 6,000 passed. Wait, I really screwed something up. Um, and, and these are useful things to do. If um, you also, if you're wanting to submit patches, if you're wanting to do a full test run uh, natively, that takes about a half hour. Uh, with Kua, it takes about three hours. Um, uh, some of that is due to slowness, but a lot of that is due to um, uh, a bug in Kua or that, I'm sorry, not a bug in QMU that causes runaways. Um, so a test that normally would take a couple of seconds takes um, 10 or 15 minutes to fail uh, in this environment because it uh, goes into an infinite loop and just sits there and loops until Kua says, oh, you've used too much CPU time. So um, since this talk, because one of the purposes of this talk is to educate people about um, uh, QMU and different things, different ways you can contribute. I have a little bit of the interesting parts of the QMU tree. I'm not gonna uh, belabor it too much. Uh, it's mostly for the slides for people that are looking later, um, but uh, BSD user contains the code that implements all of this stuff. Um, it's about 45,000 lines of code to do all of this. Um, and we've also started sharing between BSD user and Linux user. There's a common user. Right now we use it for uh, the uh, signal safe system call handling um, and a couple of other little things. Uh, we'd like to expand that in the future. Also, uh, QMU uses Mason for all its building, um, which is an important thing uh, to realize if you're wondering, hey, how do all these files get listed? How does this build system hold together? I'm not gonna talk about Mason too much. Um, QMU has it uh, well integrated. So you just type make or you do a configure and then a make. Uh, so it's hidden from you. But uh, it, otherwise, um, you know, if you're wanting to add things, it's not hidden to developers. Inside a BSD user, there's a number of um, different sections. Uh, there's uh, FreeBSD, NetBSD, and OpenBSD uh, directories that contain the um, source code uh, necessary to implement uh, the system calls for those um, systems. I'll talk about the status of, of all of the systems here in a little bit. And then um, there's a number of architectural directories, PowerPC, ARCH64, ARM, etc. cetera. Um, and those contain the architectural specific files that you need to implement each individual architecture. Uh, I'll uh, talk about that here in a minute. Um, also, if you go back and look at um, Stacy and uh, Sean's talk at BSD CAN a few years ago. Uh, Stacy talks about uh, the different things you need to implement as well. He, he focuses on functions. I'll focus on files just as a complementary thing to that resource. Uh, in addition, there's a number of BSD.h um, files that in theory are supposed to implement system calls that are common to all the BSDs. Um, right now, there's really only two. There's BSD file and BSD proc for file related system calls, although there are a few others that have gotten mixed in and uh, proc for all the process related system calls. And um, in theory, this should be only for the pan BSD uh, files or um, system calls that are implemented only or that are going across all the BSDs. Uh, but as I'll get to a little bit later, uh, some FreeBSD specific things are in here and some stuff that might be needed for NetBSD or OpenBSD have been removed. Um, and then uh, the next set of files that are interesting are BSD load and ELF load uh, and ELF core.c. These are the uh, support for uh, all, all things ELF. So loading binaries and shared libraries and all of that. You would go here if you were looking for a bug. 
main.c is basically the main loop. It uh, is the thing that parses the command line arguments uh, and then calls the elf loader to load the initial binary and sets up the uh, QMU environment. So it creates the CPU um, and the, the TCG um, uh, just-in-time compiler. The TCG uh, just-in-time compiler is the thing that implements the uh, CPU and the instructions and all of its uh, traps and exceptions. Uh, signal.c is a BSD specific signal handling so that um, this serves two purposes. One, um, it uh, masks and unmasks signals so that we don't get a crazy signal at a time we don't expect. Uh, and it also handles uh, dealing with signals that the guest may set up uh, wrapping them in a, in a machine independent way to call the machine dependent code that's in Arch to uh, handle uh, signals being delivered. Uh, and then there's a couple of trace uh, routines as well. And then you access, this is the thing that locks and unlocks memory um, into uh, QMU. Um, in order for the BSD emulator to access the memory, it has to lock the memory first and then it does its accesses and then it unlocks the memory. And that is so that the soft MMU that um, was on the diagram on a previous slide um, can handle the mapping between host address and uh, guest address. And it's very important that, that you have these in pairs and that you um, don't access an address that you got from a locking operation after you unlock, because there's no guarantees that that will be there. If you're hacking on a uh, BSD user, this is a hard lesson that everybody learns. Um, you can learn it up front or you can learn it the first time you make a mistake because pretty much everybody makes mistakes here. Um, so the uh, FreeBSD specific bits. Um, I have a, a long list of OS dash whatever, most of them are dot H's, there's a few dot C's. They implement all of those different uh, system calls. I'm not gonna read through all of these. Um, people can read the slides later, but this is where we put all of the interesting uh, FreeBSD specific calls. Although there's a number of calls that are in here that have been adopted by other BSDs. So um, you know, some refactoring could be useful. Uh, in addition to the system calls, there are things that I probably best characterize as ABI issues. How are signals delivered? What are the SIG info and M context and U context? And a number of details around threads and uh, the layout of different processes. Um, those vary by architecture. Um, and that information is included uh, in this as well. They vary by architecture and by OS. And the OS part of the variation is here. Uh, speaking of architecture, um, we also have a signal.c in the architecture portion, um, and that is used for dealing with the architecture specifics of delivering a signal and coping with uh, M context and U context, which are some low level details about how POSIX defines that signals are handled and delivered and you switch context as you uh, take a signal or do a SIG return. You're allowed to do a SIG return when you're not in a signal handler and it jumps to the new context, which um, is an interesting feature. I had no clue existed until I started on this work. Um, then there's target.h, and that's a relatively new file that doesn't exist in Linux user and only exists in the uh, um, Blitz branch. I'll, I'll tell you about the different QMU branches here in a few minutes. Um, and it has generic information about the architecture. Some architectures pair registers to get 64-bit quantities, some do not. Um, and there's a few other details about the specific architecture that is included there so that we can write the system calls in a generic manner. Um, and then again, as with the OS, there's a whole long list of um, a whole long list of files here um, that are all the things I just said, but for the architecture specific bits. You know, how exactly ARM delivers signals is different than how x86 delivers signals. Same, you know, which registers need to be set and cleared for thread um, creation or switching um, details about the VM layout. All of that stuff uh, has a OS dependent component and an architecture dependent component. Um, and then the last one here is the uh, syscall.h. 
and that is uh, for all the system calls. Um, sorry, that's for all the glue necessary to do system calls on this particular architecture. Um, so I've talked about a number of things that exist in the source tree level of support. Let me tell you about what actually works. FreeBSD works right now, modulo a couple of bugs I'll talk about here in a few minutes. Um, it's fairly complete. We're able to use it to build tens of thousands of uh, packages uh, for different architectures. And um, it's the bulk of the work that I'm upstream. NetBSD and OpenBSD have directories, uh, but they don't build. They haven't built in a very long time in the BSD user branch. And they, there's a lot of work needed to uh, sort out, um, to sort that out. Uh, first and foremost, the uh, signal uh, M context and U context is different for OpenBSD and NetBSD versus FreeBSD. So that level of difference needs to be uh, sorted out. And there's dozens of other uh, little details like that, which um, if you're interested in um, making this code work, I'll be happy to talk to you about. But for now, just know that there's a lot of work that would require be required to hook this back up. When I started the upstreaming process, I thought, oh, it'll be easy. I'll hook that back up and I'll be a nice citizen. And um, it turned into a big pile of work. So I very quickly abandoned that. I don't have anything useful that I even started with. Another um, issue is the current layout it doesn't have an architecture specific OS specific component. It's really a, it's not an either or uh, for some of the dependencies that you have. It's more a cross product. So NetBSD ARM has different things that it's doing than FreeBSD ARM, both at the OS level um, and at the architecture level. So at the OS, um, at the architecture level, like I said, M context and U context are different, but at the, um, OS level, uh, the, there are different structures that are different between the two. They're, they're functionally equivalent. They're logically the same, but physically they're different and they have different ABIs associated with it. And so we would need to find some way to go back and refactor things so that the current stuff that's muddled or maybe in the wrong place winds up being in the right place. Um, in terms of architectural support, what works and what doesn't with QMU right now? Um, they're supported and then there's working. Um, so ARMv7 is probably the most heavily used of all the architectures and it's the one that has the most packages that build and it tends to work the best. Uh, it's what I do all my initial testing on. Um, AR64 is a close second. Um, I do a number of testing until recently, we were building all our packages in the package cluster with that. Uh, and then there was an unfortunate breakage in uh, QEMU and things didn't get built for a long time. And when people came back to it, they go, oh, we have hardware. We can build in hardware much more quickly now. So those builds are now built natively. Uh, RISC-V also works fairly well. When I've tested it, it's, te it's, it's pretty close to ARM in terms of the level of support. There's a, it um, passes a few fewer tests and takes a little longer to do it. And I'm not sure why that is. I haven't investigated more fully because um, my main focus has been on ARM uh, and getting things upstream. Um, there is support for x86, but it's very incomplete. You can run Hello World and you can run anything that doesn't use a signal, which means no threads, um, and nothing, probably nothing that it does uses any kind of sophisticated command line editing. Um, and it's okay for doing a quick smoke test, but not much else. It really needs to be fleshed out. And that's one of the things that uh, people could potentially help with if you're looking for an area to help with. It's not a high priority, but it'd be, it's a nice to have. Um, PowerPC, um, Brandon Dragon, um, or B Dragon username, I may have got his name wrong. And if I do, I apologize, Brandon, um, has uh, been working on getting PowerPC, particularly PowerPC 64 Little Indian working. Um, that exists in Blitz. The stuff that is in um, the older branch doesn't work. Um, I'll talk again, I'll get to what the branches are in a second. 
Uh, and then there's MIPS uh, and Spark 64, but those have been removed in um, the Blitz branch because the FreeBSD project removed uh, those as well. So um, you know, the uh, QMU, generally speaking, uh, targets supported FreeBSD releases. Uh, and so anything that FreeBSD no longer supports, we remove. There is one big exception to that. Um, BSD user still supports the FreeBSD 11 system calls because Rust, um, Rust doesn't have a live C layer and goes directly to the system calls. And uh, last time I checked, uh, Rust does not use the post um, I know 64 uh, system calls. So we still have to support that if we have any hope of making Rust work. I know I said Rust didn't work, but um, Kyle Evans had it working in the past and uh, due to uh, changes in uh, QMU base, it stopped working in one of the updates. So um, of course, if you wanna work on this project, you're gonna to need to know where to find it. Um, the uh, QMU upstream is hosted at GitLab uh, at the URL I have on the screen. Uh, and it's mirrored to GitHub as well. Um, they have a number of interesting uh, CI integrations that you can do so that when you push to GitLab, you can get um, some or all of your continuous integration run um, with their GitLab setup. Uh, you specify how much when you do the push. You can say, uh, don't do any, which is the default, um, or uh, do a basic run, which basically it would be the equivalent of our current uh, Citrus CI. You know, it does a build and it does a smoke test on one or two things. And then a full CI adds a bunch of other tests to it. Um, that's not uh, get available if you have a GitHub fork, uh, but it is if you have a uh, GitLab. And then the BSD user repo is uh, hosted on GitLab. Uh, we created a QMU BSD user um, when, um, uh, Kyle and I took this over uh, from uh, Sean Bruno, uh, who also had it hosted on GitHub. And there's two branches of interest in this uh, repository, the Blitz branch, um, which is the most current version. I'll, I'll tell a story about that here in a second. And then the BSD user rebase 3.1, which is the most recent um, version that works really well. And that's the basis for the normal port. The Blitz branch is the basis for the develop port, the QMU user static and QMU user static develop uh, ports. Um, the Blitz, Blitz branch got its name because uh, I had created two branches to deal with upstream and I had Blitz, which was everything. Just um, I applied the, the 3.1 branch to the latest QMU tree. I made it compile and it was quick and dirty, uh, kind of a Blitz screen. Um, a very quick uh, uh, attempt to get it working. And then I had the Kaizen branch, which was um, where I would break down this huge chunk of work into individually committable things that I could upstream. And for a while I had these two branches and I kept rebasing forward blitz. And after a while I realized that this was um, perhaps a mistake um, because I couldn't find when certain things broke. I, it was very difficult. I would have to look in my rough logs to find where I rebased this. And when you have 180 changes, it's hard. You know, you get an entry on for, on rough log when you rebase for each and every one of those. And you know, I was rebasing all the time. So Blitz is now a merged branch um, to um, QMU's master. Um, and every time I uh, do a uh, upstream push, I will rebase. Sometimes a little more frequently, but usually that's the cadence I like to do that at. Uh, so um, here's the current status. I say I have a question. Um, I'll address the question here in a minute. Um, actually, I think I'll do it now. It's about uh, an update on my knowledge of Rust. The Rust seaport contained a number of patches uh, Jan is reporting um, for the iNode 64, um, but because Rust assumed that the platform triple is just a pair and a dummy, their tooling has trouble supporting 12 and 13 because that would they would have to treat them differently for different but similar ports. 
So that's um, that's very good information, Jan. So we'll be supporting the 11 um, API, I guess, through the life for another year and a half until uh, the 12 branch goes um, uh, obsolete. So um, anyway, back to the BSD user status. Um, so right now, uh, QMU base, or sorry, QMU upstream, it's very incomplete. You can run hello world. Um, you can run hello world um, that's dynamically linked. Uh, and these were two separate patch streams that accomplished this for FreeBSD. The NetBSD build and OpenBSD build has been removed because it doesn't even build anymore. Um, and it didn't even work when it did build. I tried um, to say, well, maybe it makes sense to keep those at the hello world level of support and um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make the build work. And when you actually go to make the build work in the post meson environment, um, it doesn't. And to make it work was a big pile of work. So uh, since that wasn't my primary focus, I said, okay, it's not gonna build. Um, and that might be unfair to the other BSDs, but I'm perfectly happy to work with them if they would like uh, to make that happen. Um, and I would be happy to help them get that upstream if they wanna make that happen. So far, nobody's been all that interested. Um, I've reached out to the different BSDs in the past and um, they said, hey, we don't use it, we're not interested in it. If it showed up and it was working, we might start using it. But yeah, it's for me to show up with it working, you know, is probably me working on it full time for a couple of months. And I don't, I don't have that kind of time. Um, the current rebase 3.1 BSD user branch um, is our current production version. And that's the thing that we use in the package cluster to do all the package builds. Um, and um, it currently builds about 20,000 ports, I guess 15,000 um, is the latest number. I did this slide before I did the statistics slide. So that's the discrepancy in case any uh, sharp-eyed viewers are noticing. Um, but most of that is because Rust and Go don't work. And there's a couple of other um, interesting packages that break or unbreak over time. And it's unclear exactly why. Maybe it's the same sort of bug, maybe not. Um, but uh, the Rust and Go support is fundamentally broken because threading is broken. When you get a lot of threads, there is some race that's either due to an atomic not working correctly or it's due to some kind of memory corruption because we're not managing memory with the soft MMU correctly. Um, I've pretty much, I'll talk about that here in a minute as well. Um, uh, so with the Blitz branch, that's the current um, development branch. That's what I'm using to upstream. I make any changes that I need to make as part of the upstreaming process to the Blitz branch. I'll do limited bug fixes back to the, the Rebase 3.1 branch. Um, and it's also racy, but due to changes in QMU so that it is more aggressive about retiring memory, the races seem to happen a lot more often than they do in the 3.1 branch. So um, I've not tried to do a full package run, but if 15,000 ports are working in the 3.1 branch, I would guess maybe 10 or 9,000 are working in this branch. Um, the list of ports that I have are, that our problem children also includes live intel, which is the basis for a large number of ports. Um, so here's the, some upstreaming statistics. We started between, depending on how you round the diff, between 36 and 40,000 lines of diff. Um, Stacy uh, Son and everybody else that I credited in my BSD CAN talk, um, did a lot of work. A lot of it was copied from Linux user and a lot of it had to be written for FreeBSD, particularly all the threading stuff, which was um, not fun to write. Um, we're down to about uh, 27,000 lines. So we're down about 9,000 lines in diff. Um, 3,000 of that was uh, just from extra junk that had accumulated. Um, people made copies of files that weren't actually referenced. Um, and then the different architectures that I removed um, account for another 3K. And I've gotten maybe about 5K net of code upstreamed. One of the problems 
is that when uh, in 2013, 2014, when Stacy started the project, um, he copied a bunch of stuff from Linux uh, user, which is fine. The license totally allows it, nothing wrong with that, and got it working, which is great. And in the meantime, uh, QMU's coding standards change. So um, if I try to upstream anything on these files, one of the first things I run into is their picky patch checking script rejects it. So I had to make it, you know, make the style conform, and that inflated the number of lines of difference um, between the two. I think I mostly worked through all of that, but um, each area that I um, go to start upstreaming, I have to go through and do a style run because uh, QMU's style differs a little bit from FreeBSD's style in a number of key ways, and they're quite picky about uh, rejecting changes like that. Um, so 27,000 lines sounds like a, an awful lot of code, but um, there's about 2,000, 1,800 lines of code for NetBSD and another 2,000, maybe 1,600 lines of code for OpenBSD that are different between the two um, repositories. Um, it looked like uh, Stacy was trying to keep up for a little while and then gave up. Um, and I haven't bothered to upstream them. I'm quite, I'm tempted to delete them both, but I'm gonna do that last um, in the upstreaming process. Um, and then we've got uh, three new architectures that um, we've added support for, um, ARCH64, uh, RISC-V, and PowerPC that need to be upstreamed. There's about 3000 lines of code there. I've got um, uh, ARM, upstreamed and there's almost no differences. I think there's one or two trivial differences I noticed when I was making this talk and I will fix that you know, soon. Um, but I'm focusing primarily on system calls because those are a little bit easier to upstream because the vast majority of system calls are um, of the sort, uh, you know, the right system call is lock the memory, call right, unlock the memory and you know, Chamad or Cheroot or all of those are just, you know, some variation of that. And those are all very short and easy and uh, which makes them easy to get reviewed and which makes the upstreaming process easier. Um, and so there's one last thing. We have about 13K lines of diffs in the FreeBSD directory, um, which are all the FreeBSD specific uh, system calls and ioctals. Um, and that Stacy and others have implemented. Um, and then there's 7K still in BSD user that I've uh, not gone through and you know figured out uh, this is good, this is bad, and tried to um, get all of that upstreamed. Um, so the bottom line is like, we've got about 10,000 down um, and about 23,000 uh, to go. Um, that should say 13,000, I don't know, 23,000 to go. Um, the 15 or 20K looks to be tedious, but fairly boilerplate. They're all just system calls and it's the same pattern and it's easy to get a review. Um, there's, um, when I've looked at it, there may be two dozen or so system calls that um, don't quite fit this pattern because uh, things that mask signals, uh, that deal with signals are special um, and so need to have extra code that is beyond what I just described. Um, and then there's a bunch of system calls that I've looked at that I just, I, it was kind of, you know, I had the reaction, I just can't deal with this right now. I'm not even going to try to understand what's going on here. Um, you know, and it's, uh, when I get back to it, it'll be probably a crapshoot getting that upstream because if I don't understand what's going on, nobody else is going to be under, um, upstream will be understand what's going on with less, unless I uh, provide the proper context. Um, so if you want to get, if you want to help uh, x86 port, make that complete, uh, a lot of refactorings uh, still needed. Um, there's a lot of boilerplate, a lot of duplication. Um, and uh, doing the upstreaming, I find myself wondering, can't this all just be generated because it's all boilerplate? Can't we just generate all of the non-contentious, non-special um, system calls? Uh, like we generate um, templates for them in the kernel, maybe now that the, we've got the Lua uh, generation, that might 
uh, make things easier. Um, I haven't pursued any of these ideas. These are, if people want to, a cool project, um, that might be an interesting thing uh, to look at um, as well. Um, I see that Brad, uh, or sorry, Brooks Davis is telling me that Conrad has scripts for that. It would have been nice if he told me he had scripts for that. But um, now that I know, I can ask him. Um, and it'd be nice if we could do something about the BS, NetBSD and OpenBSD code that's rotting, but it's probably gonna take a NetBSD or um, OpenBSD zealot to actually flesh that out. Oh, I totally forgot Brooks, my, my apologies. Um, Brooks is telling me that he told me about the scripts and I think he's right, so. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so for upstreaming, uh, when we started, everything, everything's broken, nothing's working at all. Everything core dumped uh, for all the BSDs. Um, at this point, um, we have ARM uh, upstreamed and we have enough system calls so that um, uh, working, so they, hello world works. Um, I'm in the process of uh, upstreaming the file, uh, the uh, routines that are in BSD file.h. Um, that's about a thousand lines of change. And with luck, that will be in 7.1. And then I'll get started on all the others. Um, and I've removed the obsolete architectures and the build on the other BSDs. Um, so the biggest thing that I need help with, um, the biggest thing that is blocking this, um, is the synchronization um, bug that I was referring to. It looks like an atomic is not working or that there's some memory corruption so that um, one of two things happen, either asserts, um, let's say, hey, I woke up and my mutex isn't in the state for somebody who just went to sleep and is just waking up, uh, fire or things sleep forever which um, is either an atomic not working or some kind of memory corruption, which uh, could be um, due to um, one of the system calls not having all of the locking and unlocking pairs done properly. Um, so, and that's also um, blocking Rust and Go and a bunch of other packages from, from working uh, because more and more things are multi-threaded these days. Um, but that's a big ask. I mean, I've probably sunk 50 or 60 hours into trying to debug this to date um, to come up with a, a problem statement as coherent as the one that I just gave. And I'll admit that there's a lot of uh, hand waving as what might be going on because it could be something completely different. Um, but an, an additional um, help that's needed. I mean, the purpose of this talk was to um, ask for help. Um, would be to um, get reviewers on Cumia. So when I submit patches, it would be nice if people would, um, you know, I could CC them so you don't have to subscribe to Cumia Devel, which is a big fire hose of a list. Um, it would be nice to get um, patches reviewed um, by, by people, which helps the upstreaming process. Right now, um, we're, uh, we're basically beholden to the, uh, some of the people upstream to get reviews because um, those are the only ones that can competently review it. Um, and Cumu really, really, really likes it, doesn't like you to submit unreviewed changes. So um, that would help um, refactoring so we can share more with uh, Linux user. Um, I guess looking at Conrad's scripts um, to see how much of the, um, we could uh, go to generate potentially even generating it at compile time uh, so that upstreaming just involves updating tables and not updating a, a lot of code. Um, and there's a lot of bugs to fix uh, as well. In addition to the one that I mentioned on the previous screen, um, there's a lot of tests that are failing um, uh, that have nothing to do with uh, threads or stream or anything like that, that uh, could potentially uh, be useful to go fix. That would be a, um, a good way to learn the system and to get things up and running. Um, and there's always a need for new system calls and new IOCTLs to expand 
the footprint that QMU is uh, targeting. Um, and I've already talked about the need for uh, folks from uh, NetBSD or OpenBSD. Uh, so I guess questions, although if I'm reading the time correctly, I either have zero minutes or 15 minutes, and I'm guessing zero minutes for questioning. Um, people that have been working- zero. <laughs> That's closer to zero. <laughs> um, so um, if people uh, want to uh, help, you can send me email or you can uh, join hash virtualization on Discord or pound BSD user on Fnet. Um, that's where people that have been working on it have hang out. Um, it's been kind of quiet lately. So I'm hoping it's that, uh, you know, that this is a fun project for people that um, want to help out. And I guess with that, that's my talk. So I will ask you, I'll proxy one question from IRC, which is Manu asks, what is the relationship like with Upstream? Oh, that's a good question. The relationship is very cordial. Um, one of the things that I've been doing uh, has been uh, reviewing Linux user patches, which um, makes uh, them very happy. They always like more reviewers. But um, the upstream several years ago was it seemed was viewed uh, from the BSD side as being somewhat hostile. When I took this over from Sean Bruno, he was like, we tried to upstream and it didn't work. Um, and now it's like, well, why haven't you upstream? We would love this to be in the tree. We, you know, this is a great um, technology uh, showcase for us. So, um, you know, that's uh, one of the things that um, has improved. Upstream is very willing to take patches um, and is, um, you know, somewhat uh, positive uh, towards these efforts. So. Um, it's not like um, it's not like it was in the past where you would send the patches and nothing would ever happen. Um, I've also managed to talk them into being a upstream maintainer, as has uh, Kyle Evans. Um, so we're in the maintainers file. We get CC'd on patches, which also helps head off some uh, almost all of the problem patches that go in. Um, and so, um, uh, so that's. Um, you know, that's where uh, where we are with upstream. Uh, you know, it's um, a situation where all of this is worthwhile upstreaming um, because, um, you know, it's uh, it, it's a situation where, you know, you, you make effort and you get rewards. Um, for 7.1, it looks like I'll be able to get about uh, 12 or 1300 of these lines upstreamed um, and, all the reviews I've gotten within a week. So I guess that answers that question. Um, and I guess John's gonna tell us, hey, go to the hallway track for the rest of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's about right. Um, so we can head over to the hallway track. We have uh, one more break and then I think we'll have our last talk of the day after that. Um, so I'll see you all over in the hallway track. We'll be back here in about 27 minutes. <laughs>